Terry, just keep an eye on those. If they keep that up, like, I might have to shout over them, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> the usual death. Slow death for them, please. <laughs> Slow. Come in closer. Right, the tour is given in English. If you're having difficulty with the word closer, it might be beyond you. <laughs> Get closer. Yeah, that's more like it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Yes, welcome to Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress. Sorry, Tower of London. Uh, my brolly, I, it was mislaid. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Andy, could you just um, go and tear the heads off those children over there? <laughs> They're giving it large. Thank you. Right. Welcome to Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress of Tower of London. I'm Yeoman Warder Bill Callahan, and for the next hour or so, I'm going to be your guide. Now, together, we're going to tour the fortress. I'm going to point out some of the very famous buildings inside it, and then I'm going to bore you to death with their history. That's right, kids. <laughs> history. Now, don't worry, this is not the history that you had to endure at school. You should remember that that history was largely written by people who were never there. You're now going to get that history coloured in with the Omen Warder folklore. Stories from men that were there. Men who saw. Or at least knew somebody. <laughs> <laughs> who possibly saw uh, what went on. Now isn't that exciting? Yeah. I'm glad one or two of you think so, yeah. The Tower of London has been a palace and fortress here for nearly a thousand years. But it has developed something of a reputation. A grim reputation. Many people think of the Tower of London primarily as a prison. a prison, yeah, and you do us a great disservice. In our long history here, we had only three and a half thousand prisoners. If you pan that out, it's about four people a year. Small, <laughs> insignificant detail. Many people think all our prisoners were executed. And again, not so. Only 363 were executed, which isn't bad. It's about one in ten. It's obviously bad if you're that one, but it's better than the state of Texas. I understand. Yeah, or even Oklahoma, yeah. Yes! Now, of these executions, most people think they were all beheaded. And you do us another disservice. They weren't. Only 120 people were beheaded. So it's a very small part of our history, and I'm sure you don't want me to talk about that. Do you? Yes. You do? Yes. Right, it's beheadings or the zoo. What do you want me to talk about? Beheadings. Well, you had a choice. Okay. The beheadings, the public ones anyway, used to take place up there on Tower Hill. On execution day, thousands of bloodthirsty people, not unlike yourselves, <laughs> would gather around a raised wooden platform that we call the scaffold. Now the scaffold was covered with straw, and the straw was there, obviously, to absorb the blood. You see, you know this. <laughs> there was also a man clad in leather, and a leather mask covered half his face. This man was, of course, the Executioner. Executioner. The tools of his trade, block of oak and a large axe. You see, you all know this. <laughs> Did you know the Tower of London was a zoo? No. no! I could have told you about that, but you've missed that chance. <laughs> Something you might not know about the beheadings up there was that the condemned man and the executioner used to get rather pally. They'd shake hands. A purse of gold and silver coins would be passed to the executioner. This was some religious significance to this. You, could, um, you couldn't take your material wealth with you to the afterlife, you see. But you could give the executioner a healthy tip in advance to make sure he did his job well. And that's what happened. One fellow, James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth, famously refused to pay his executioner. His executioner, Jack Ketch, got grumpy. When James Scott stretched his neck across the block of oak, Jack Ketch brought his axe crashing down. Whack! Right through James Scott's 
shoulder. Oh, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. It took Jack Ketch five strokes of his axe just to kill James Scott. A further three strokes and the head was still hanging on. Jack threw down his axe, took out his butcher's carving knife and saw through the last bits of flesh, bone and gristle. Oh, you, you wanted to hear this, don't blame me. <laughs> you could have learned all about the polar bears and the lions and the tigers we had here, but no. The head was then impaled on a soldier's pike. The point broke out through the top of the skull, dragging bits of brain with it. I didn't need to tell you that. <laughs> the soldier then led a parade through the streets of London. The head and the pipe were left on London Bridge as a warning to other would-be traitors. And it also served as an early form of bird feeder. <laughs> Environmentally friendly. <laughs> Meanwhile, the headless corpse was brought back inside the fortress for burial in the chapel where we shall end our tour. As I say, that is a small part of our history and I don't want to dwell on it. The Tower of London is primarily a palace and fortress. We are now standing over the moat. Take a look at that. 40 metres across. Wider than you expected, eh? Further than an archer could shoot accurately. I know what you're thinking. Kevin Costner, Errol Flynn, they could all shoot an arrow. And three miles later, some poor sap gets it here. Well, disavow yourself of that notion. War archery was never that accurate. Our archers on the ramparts could shoot anybody trying to cross the moat in relative safety from anyone on the far bank trying to shoot them. Twice a day, the tidal flow of the River Thames would flood in and ebb out. This kept the moat clean. Clever? No, not really. At low tide, there was no water and the enemy could just run across. So in 1381, we called in a consultant. The Dutch engineer, Master Walter, took the moat out deeper than the riverbed. This meant it would never fully drain and always present an obstacle. Clever? Yes. No! <laughs> Secondary function of the moat, toilet. Oh. Two and a half thousand people inside that fortress, tens of thousands around the outside. And every one of these people, most of them more than once a day, added to the contents of the moat. You know what I'm talking about. It doesn't always float away. <laughs> At low tide, this became nothing more than a mire of raw human poo. <laughs> Carcasses from the meat market at Smithfield, plague victims who were all tossed in. We had everything in the moat. Typhoid, cholera, anthrax, <laughs> plague. And polar bears. <laughs> yeah, the polar bears were allowed to swim in the moat to catch fish. It wasn't all they caught. <laughs> they caught cholera and died. Yes. The moat as a toilet was a failure. But as a line of defence, I think you'll agree. It was superb. It was obviously a health hazard and it stank. It really did. This was a royal palace. We couldn't put up with that. The moat didn't last very long. A mere 500 years. It was finally drained in 1843, filled in and laid to lawn. Look how lush and green the grass now grows. <laughs> Gardening tips, huh? <laughs> We're not even in the fortress yet. This is the outer wall. We began on this in 1280. There are six towers that face south to defend against any attack that might have come from up the river. And the Byward Tower is one of them. But it's unique. This is the only landward entry into the fortress. It's also your exit, so remember that. As we go through the archway, look up, you'll see the spikes of a portcullis. That's a drop gate. It weighs one and a half tonnes. So does the rope, which holds it up. <laughs> yes. We're going to go through there rather quickly. Come along. Chop, chop. 